Without forget. I'm going to begin by reading all of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that ye might do them in the land where ye go to possess it. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house, and upon thy gates. And it shall be, when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. Ye shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God, as ye tempted him in Massah. Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, and his testimonies and his statutes, which he hath commanded thee. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest go in and possess the good land, which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to cast out all thine enemies from before thee, as the Lord hath spoken. And when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies, and the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then shalt thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and sore, upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence, that he might bring us in to give us the land which he sware unto our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Right away in verse 1, these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that ye might do them in the land whither you go to possess it. So God here is giving commands that they would teach and they would be something that's practical where you'd actually do it. You don't just learn and fill yourself up with knowledge of these things. Rather you learn the teaching in order that you would do it that thou mightest, and here's a second uh, side effect to hearing the teaching and receiving it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God, fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and commandments which I command thee, that thou, thy son, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. Keep your finger there and go to Psalm chapter 
86. Psalm chapter 86. God wants us to learn these commands that we would do these commands and that His fear would always be before us. And that's not a bad thing because if we fear God, we will fear none else. A lot of us can be, you know, grew up and we were afraid of the dark when we were younger. Or we're, we're now afraid of our finances falling to shambles. Or we're afraid of sickness. But, Psalm 86, if we're fearing God, then we need not fear anything else. Psalm chapter 86 and verse 11, the Bible says, Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. That word unite was mentioned back in the context of Deuteronomy chapter 6 as well. There is a un uniting of the heart with the fear of God. And that is essentially like a marriage bond. When you hear the teaching of the statutes of God, your heart gets united with the Father above. It's, it's one of these things where God's teaching enters in and your heart is driven only to fear Him. This is the working of God. This is not something I can teach you in a 10-step program to conjure up of your own self. No, you have to hear the teaching of the truth. Walk in the teaching of the truth to get a united heart to the God above. He will bring together our heart with Him through the judgment, statutes, and teachings that He is giving unto us. Go back then to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and in verse 3 it says, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it might be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. And so there is the land that is promised. For us, it's just godly Christian living and the, the, the success and the rejoicing and the satisfaction that comes with essentially walking on higher ground with God. Here it's shown as a promised land, a land that flows with milk and honey. That, that's, that's a land that flows with sustenance and sustenance that you need generally. That's your milk, your daily bread, your daily provision, but also honey, the greater things. That's what they were promised when they would enter into that land if they did so in the state of obedience and walking with God. Verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Keep your finger there and go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one Lord. The Lord is one God is what he is stressing here. He's... he's, he's He's giving them a, a, a fixed point of reference for when they're dealing with the scriptures, the teachings, the statutes and judgments. Hear this, the Lord our God is one Lord. In other words, He's not going to be divided of mind, of type, of heart. God is one Lord is what He is teaching here. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, look what the Apostle Paul teaches. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. He's encouraging now that you would walk worthy of the vocation, of the position, of the status by which you are called. And that says God's child. The one Lord has called you to be His child. Walk worthy then of that. And how do you do that? With lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. Being the child of the king should not bring any kind of pride or prejudice towards your brother. It shouldn't bring you to a spot where you think that you're somehow better than somebody else. Because how do we become God's child? Through a gift that we didn't deserve, right? So God is asking you through the Apostle Paul to walk worthy in a lowly, meek, long-suffering, forbearing way amongst your brethren. Verse 3, it says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Okay? It says this, we're to unite in this, the one Spirit, and in a bond of peace. Join in peace. Verse 4, there is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, 
one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. There's a unity in God, and there's a unity in the, within the context of the people of God. And this is what the apostle here is trying to highlight to us. There's a commonality. We're all knit together in what? Unity of the Spirit. That shows us there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is above all and through all and in you all. There is a unity amongst God's people to, and a devotion to, the one God. We need to understand that in order to get the right perspective on the teachings that are coming. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Because this is what he's presenting to us. There's a unity. You are a group that has come together as a congregation called out by God through the workings that he did in Egypt to bring you out of the world, the great signs and wonders that he used to display the fact that you are different. He gave you statutes and judgments to show that you are different. He said, don't follow after the ways of Egypt. Don't seek after the ways of the nation into where you are about to settle, but rather follow my lead. And he says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So in other words, there is one standard. There is one standard maker. There is one king. There is one master. There is one Lord. Follow after God in the statutes and judgments that he is giving you right now. What's he going to show to us? Verse 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. The first great command comes to us here in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and it was quoted later by Jesus Christ. Go to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. We're at the beginning of your New Testament. You'll find the book of Matthew. And in Matthew chapter 22, and in verse 37, the Bible says this. When he was asked, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And then he continues on and he says, And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, I believe what that's teaching is essentially when you think of a, 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 a hanging swing, right? It's got two pivot points, okay? Everything that is that swing, including the people that are sitting on it, is held up by two points. God here is saying is there are two main commandments. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, strength, and love thy neighbor as thyself. On these hold, on these hang, the two greatest commandments. And those two, if they were one of us to let go, the whole thing falls apart. That's showing men that we have a unity in our commission to love God and to love our neighbor. And that's how we exist in this life. And that's how we put a foundation, a practical foundation on everything that we do. What am I doing today? What is a decision that I have to make? When I'm making that decision, how do I be sure that I'm loving God and loving my neighbor? And if we were to consciously think about that every single time we made a decision, we would be much better off because that's the foundation. That's where everything starts in the Christian life. Love God, love your neighbor. Love God, love your neighbor. Why do you got to love your neighbors? Why is that so important to loving God? You think loving God above all things would be enough, and then you can just whatever your neighbor. But it's because your neighbor is made in the image of God. And you express your love towards God by interacting with your neighbor. How can you love God whom you've never seen when you don't love your neighbor? You're showing the God that you have never seen, that you believe in by faith, that you follow by faith, love toward Him by exhibiting to your brothers and sisters in Christ, and to an extent the world at large. Love your neighbor as yourself. What that also does, it puts everything into a perspective of selflessness. God, everyone else, me. Right? The proper order of respect and love and care should be in that place. God, 
your neighbor, and then myself. Finally, I will love myself. No man that ever loves himself didn't exhibit that love towards other people. We're full of ourselves, and that's our problem. This is why God had to make this a sure commandment. The best way to love God is to love others, and this passage has that truth in here. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Jesus said, here are the two main commandments. The greatest commandment is love the Lord thy God, and the second is like unto it. They're very similar, and that's to love thy neighbor as thyself. When you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, many of these uh, these these verses with um or these Bibles with the uh, connection points, right? They'll just say that Jesus was quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5, but they'll leave out the fact that he's also continually quoting when he deals with the topic of loving your neighbor as yourself. Not quoting it verbatim, but he's expressing the same topic, and that's how it continues here. Verse 6, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 6, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. He's saying... The best way then, after you've loved your Lord your God with all, to love others is that these words would be in your heart. And I believe then these words in your heart will help you in fulfilling that second great commandment. Verse 7, it says this, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And the best way that you can love your children and love your Neighbors, by extension, is to teach your children the statutes and judgments that God has taught you. What that's saying is you take the command, you learn of the command, you understand it, you start doing it, and then you teach others. And this is how the love of God is shed abroad unto all, because eventually all start to learn after his same judgments, all start to love God, all start to love your neighbor, and the world becomes a better place gradually. He says, teach them diligently unto thy children. Thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. In other words, when you're sitting around in your house, talk of these statutes and of these judgments. And when thou walkest by the way, when you're going for a stroll in the park, when you're going out and about, when you're doing things, talk about these statutes and judgments when you're walking. When thou liest down and when thou risest up. In other words, right before you go to bed and as soon as you get up. What are you talking about here? Teaching diligently to your children, the people after you, the people younger than you, the people following in your example, in your footsteps. Teach them these statutes and these judgments all the time. Sitting, walking, rising, lying. Continues on in verse 8 and says, And thou shalt bind them for a sign on thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thine house and on thy gates. He's saying that the word needs to always be before you. Now, the Jews have taken advantage of that, had liberties with that, and they literally like strap the Bible to their forehead, right in Old Testament, it's frontless between the eyes. That, that's not what he's talking about here. But... In the form of the picture and of the type, it's eventually saying that these things need to be internalized. Do you literally need to write them on all the posts of your house? No, but a lot of us do put scriptures on the walls, and that's a good thing. Do we literally need to tape it to our foreheads? No, but it's a good thing to, to have it memorized, to have it in your heart and in your mind always before you. Why? Because it makes it a lot easier to diligently and with care and with a proper consciousness and with knowledge be ready to teach these things at all times to who? The next generation that's to come. And the most loving thing that we can do for our neighbors today is to teach the children that are coming after us the judgments of God. Because that will create a better society, a loving society, a united society in the things of God. And when a nation is after the things of God, look what God promises. Thy days may be prolonged. I will take you into the land that floweth with milk and honey. I will give you as promised. Go and keep your finger there. Go to Psalm chapter 78. Psalm chapter 78. Psalm chapter 78 is another one of these teaching scriptures about God's people teaching their children in the things of God. Psalm chapter 78, look at verse 1. It says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. 
is a song that Asaph is giving. And his, and his desire is that he would be able to, I believe, teach other people through the words that he's given. Give ear unto the words of my mouth. Follow after my law. Here he's under the Spirit of God giving God's teaching. He continues on in verse 4. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He hath done. Verse 5, For He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which He commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them unto their children that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep His commandments and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. His desire is that the generation to come, and he said it twice here in this passage, that the children that are following after would hope in God and not forget his works. And this is why they're continually teaching them, because they don't want them to forget everything that God has done for them. He wants them to set their hope in God. He wants them to not forget all the wonderful things that he has done, because if they do, what does he say in verse 8? they might be as their fathers, stubborn, rebellious, that generation that was discarded of God because they discarded God in their own hearts because they were not steadfast with Him. He says, he says, if they end up that way, it would be, of course, very bad for them, but it's easier then to keep the law, and I think this is what he's trying to say, it's easier to keep the law when you love the law, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, it's easier to do what they want when there's a love relationship. We have the same thing with children, right? When there's a love relationship, it's easier for children to do what their parents ask. Now, if we were to think to ourselves, in, in the stead of the people of Israel, where they're looking back and saying, we don't want the next generation to be as our fathers were, would you stand here today and say, or would you be content if your children were as you were? I mean, I, could we all just say, you know what? We, we've got it. We're doing it. We, we, we know exactly what God wants for us, and we're doing it. We're living that. I don't think any generation has ever stood in that place. But that's the reason why God keeps challenging them. And over and over, even as we've read in the first six chapters of Deuteronomy, He keeps saying, remember, keep the words, keep the love, keep the laws. Study them, learn them, teach them, absorb them. He keeps wanting us to get a hold of these truths because no generation has ever arrived. Think of the Apostle Paul. He says, not that I have arrived, right? And he was on his deathbed and one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. So we can't stand here and say, do you know what? I would be content if my children turned out exactly like me. Okay? Because I made a whole bunch of mistakes and I continue to make a lot of mistakes. And my heart is not as it should be, fully set on God, loving Him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. But I would want that for my children after me. So how do we do that? How do we make that happen? We continually remind them of the great works of God and of His love. The charge was this, when you're sitting, when you're walking, when you're rising, when you're lying, set it in your hands, in your eyes, the posts and the gates of your house. That's how, how prevalent the Word of God needs to be in your life as a reminder to the generation to come of God and all He does, that they would hope in Him and they would not forget what He has done. You can go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. You can see then Moses' heart's desire, having, having been through this thing again, this cycle where the generation learns, gets excited, zealous about God, eventually gets apathetic and then gives up on God and gets into idolatry. That generation gets wiped out because they did not have faith in God. The next generation comes up and he's already starting to witness that they're starting to get a little bit apathetic towards the things of God and a little bit rebellious towards the things of God. And so, he says you need to fear Him. You need to keep His commandments. 
If you want your days to be long, follow after these things. And Moses is trying to get them to not forget the law of God and to diligently teach it unto the generation to come so that they wouldn't forget it, so that there would be generation after generation after generation in which there would be a constant uphill onto higher things, better things in the kingdom, and working towards doing God's will instead of always on the decline. And yet we know men are such that we're just always declining from the things of God. If we don't keep upon ourselves, eventually we just stop doing the things of God. And that's just the sad story, the sad state of affairs that we all live. How do we stay focused and diligent? we got to keep in the Word. And this is why he's saying, a lot of people get bored of reading Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But I believe therein lies the power of God. Get those laws in your heart. Put them as frontless before thine eyes. Set yourself to do them. Fully commit to do them. Follow after them. By God's grace, absorb them. Learn from them. That's where the power of God is because he keeps saying that's where the power of God is. If you want to prolong your days, the law is where you need to go. Now, there was definitely a risk in forgetting. This is why he keeps saying, don't forget. <clears throat> you can read... In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 10, the Bible says, And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not. And thou, have, and thou shalt have eaten and are full, then beware. Here's the risk that comes. Then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage. See, too often we, from the standpoint of comfort and safety, forget all the things God has done. We stop seeking after God for things. How many times do you find yourself in dire straits, in a trouble, a situation, in turmoil, like there's fighting, there's struggles, and now you're praying unto God and you're asking Him for help. And then He pulls through for you and does some great miracle in your life. And then almost as, as quickly as it happens, you forget that you prayed for it. You forget that you asked God to do this great thing. And then you just move on as if you didn't do a great work in your life. We forget God that He has provided for us the stability that we have. We forget God that he, He's the one that fed us to the point where we get full. We forget that God was the one that saved us and has kept us in, you know what, I'm good, I feel good, I'm, I'm comfortable in my life right now. We forget that God's the one that heals us and He's the reason why we're healthy today. We forget that God protected us and He is the only reason why we are safe where we're at. The reality is, is that all good things, look at verses 11, and houses full of all good things were God's provision. Why? Because it says, which thou fillest not. Just take that. Full of all good things which thou fillest not. That's your life. Your life is full of good things that you didn't fill. You didn't put there. You didn't collect. You didn't bring them into your barn. Your life is full of goodness that God put there. Don't forget that. Because when we forget it, we are destined to become like the fathers were destroyed in the wilderness and not reaping the benefit of the promises that God has for us. All good things which we fill us not are ours because God was the one that filled them. Beware. Don't forget that. That's what he said. Beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. He took you out of bondage. He took you out of servitude and made you a son. You were a slave and a servant into your own sins and destined to pay for them throughout all eternity. And he saved you, pulled you up out of the mire and gave you a prominent spot in his house as his son. He filled you up. What do we too often do? We get full and then we forget. We get full of the blessings of God and we forget the God that gave us those blessings. Beware lest you do that. That's the warning that this chapter is giving you. And that's the warning that we need to take earnest heed unto. Look at verse 12. Beware lest thou forget the Lord thy God. Verse 13. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear 
by his name. Don't forget him. Don't fear somebody else. Don't fear something else. Put him above all. Serve him. Fear him. Give reverence to him. Give proper respect and honor to God that provided every good thing that you today possess. Verse 14, it says, You shall not go after other gods, but the gods of the people which were round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the angular of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee, and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. He is jealous over you, because he has a wonderful purpose for you. This is the thing that we often forget. Why would God be so jealous of me? Why can't I just do what I want? Why is God always trying to force me to serve him and force me to follow him and force me? Christians get this mindset that the commands are just there to like whoop you into shape. Well, the commandments are there to be a light. Light's going to give you clarity. It's going to give you peace. It's going to give you joy. It's going to give you a, a, a sure path in your life. Man, the worst thing that could happen in your life is just confusion and darkness and not understanding and not knowing. God gives you the command is a light to guide your steps and to lighten your life. And because He has a wonderful plan for you, that's why He gets jealous when He sees you straying from the path, following after other gods of this world, making idols out of things of this life following after commands and teachings of other spiritual leaders or, or what have you. We ought to follow after the truth contained in the Word of God, and therein lies the life that God has for you, and it's a wonderful life that He has for you, with promise, with purpose, and with uh, a, a God that will follow you through it and carry you through every step of the way. Go to 2 Timothy, keep your finger, 2 Timothy, chapter 1 and verse 9. 2 Timothy. This is what we often think. We think God's jealous because He's just trying to overbear us and overlord us and just manipulate us and control us and not let us have any fun. That's the same lie that the devil told Eve. Yea, God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God. You'll have all this power if you just disobey God. That was the promise that the devil made, and the lie is the same today. That God's trying to hold us from something by giving us a law and statutes and judgments to follow after. No, God's giving us a gateway to blessings abound by keeping those laws, following after those laws, meditating upon those laws day and night. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So even before this law, God had a purpose and had a plan and high calling for your life, and that wasn't even according to your works. And let me suggest this, that when the Bible is saying in Deuteronomy chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and it says, keep the commandments, do the commandments, keep the commandments, do the commandments, it's not talking about them in the avenue of works. In other words, I can't just make these commands a checklist and just do them, and then God's going to bless me. No, this is still a faith walk. You internalize the Word of God, believe the Word of God, and say, yep, that is good. Yes, that is right. Would to God I could do these laws. I would follow these statutes. I would keep these judgments. And then it's the Word that works back into your life, both to will and to do according to His good pleasure. We're not saved by works. We're not sanctified by works as a belief that I have. It's a faith position. I grow in grace. I grow in the gift that God has given me of His law. I can't just check the boxes and suddenly be a good Christian. Yep, I've done all of these. I'm a good Christian. No, you have to keep the faith and follow after His holy calling, which is not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace. His works. It's His works. It's His doing. It's His plan for your life. All He wants you to do is follow by faith. Just believe Him. Just trust Him. He wants you to then teach the next generation. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. So, in the same way, I'm not taking the law to my son and just beating him down with a bunch of do's and don'ts. I'm trying to captivate his heart 
to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love thy neighbor as thyself, and hang his whole livelihood on those. You see the difference? I could take the seat, right? The seat of that rocking chair, and make everything in his life be about, okay, keep, um, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt love thy um, mother and father, thou shalt not smite them, thou shalt do this, thou shalt do that, and make it all about the seat. But if those commands are not hanging on a love for God and a love for his neighbors, he's sitting on the ground, not rocking, not working, not moving, not doing what God wants. God wants us to be in motion. He wants us to be rocking in that chair. And that's why he said, all of these commands hang upon two things, and they hang there by faith. Love the Lord thy God, love thy neighbor as thyself. And if you put your focus and your heart and your intent and your desire by faith on those two end goals, everything else just kind of swings into place, doesn't it? It just kind of falls where it should be. Because the whole law of the prophets is hanging on those two things. So I need to get the heart of the child to love the Lord that gives the law. That's what we want for our children. We want them to love God. I don't want them to love the Baptist religion. I don't want them to love a list of do's and don'ts. I don't want them to love the statement of faith, the suits. I don't want them to love the religion. Okay? I want them to love the Lord. And when they love the Lord, they get this desire to love the Lord's people. And that's where all of the commands hang. And that's where real Christian growth comes. So I want the next generation to love God and to love their neighbor as themselves. Lest, the Bible says, God cloud up in rain. Because really, without faith it is impossible to please Him. So the best way to make God angry is to do things not by faith, but by, let's say, fact. Right? Do things tangibly, earthly, carnal, sensual, devilish. God wants us to walk by faith. And that is the walk for him. Honestly, I don't think God gives a rip or is one mile away from the, the religious, strict as a Pharisee, Baptist church that minds all their P's and Q's and looks outwardly a certain way. I don't think God's within a million miles from that. But you know what he will take? He will take the faith of a bunch of ragamuffins doing the best they can, following, loving God, covered in tattoos and piercings, the resemblance of the world that they had, you know, dark bags under their eyes because they grew up loving this world and then came to a love for God. Teaching and nourishing children in that same love without this legalistic beating you down, whipping you with laws kind of, kind of religion. God wants our hearts, just as I want the hearts of my child. I don't want my child to just be a robot doing whatever I say. I want him to have my heart. And because he has a heart for me, he does what I want. That's where the command lies. So, he says, and go to verse 16, You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he hath commanded thee. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest go in and possess the good land, which the Lord sware unto thy father. So, provision comes by way of the condition that you're diligently keeping the commandments of God. And how do we diligently keep the commandments of God? I believe that's right in the context of the scriptures. Teaching them diligently. Look, he says diligently keep the commandments, and then in verse 7 he says, teach them diligently. Talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest in that way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Do you know what that talks to? I mean, if I was to just give myself a checklist, like, okay, I have to read my Bible in the morning, before bed, I have to, whenever I'm walking, and whenever I'm sitting, always be teaching the Bible. I would just stop doing it because it would become this mundane routine of almost annoyance. Like I'm forcing myself, constraining myself, shackling myself like these were in his. But if that's all done from a heart which loves the law, then these things aren't a command so much as that's just the present reality. Does that make sense? 
The present reality of somebody that loves the Lord's law is somebody that when they're walking, they're talking about God's law. When they're sitting in their house, they're talking about God's law. When they're going to bed, they're thinking upon, meditating upon God's law. When they wake up, the first thing they say is, glory, glory, hallelujah, Christ has set me free. It's just, it's just the, the song, the ever-singing song in your heart is after God, after His judgments, after His statutes. And that's what we need to teach to the next generation. Not the words, the law, the letter, right, of keeping God happy, but rather the love that comes with being connected with God, and seeking after His statutes, and just loving, serving Him. They're two different things, two different opposite sides of the opposite sides of the spectrum. We want our walk and our testimony to be something that is desirous of the children that come after us. So that's what we do. We teach them by doing by setting forth that example. To the end that, look at verse 20. And when thy son asketh thee in, thine, in the time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded thee? What do we say to them when they ask us that question? Well, it should be the same for us standing here today. Okay, look at verse 21. Then thou shalt say unto thy son, we were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. First and foremost, tell them who you were, what God saved you from. The best thing that we can do to bring to remembrance of the great works that God has done is to show him who we were. Look, I was a bondman. I was trapped. I was, I was in sin. I was sent on my way to hell. I was living unrighteously. I was dragging my life through the mud. I was in bondage to Egypt, to the world. That's where I came from. This is what I was brought from. I was a bondman in Egypt, and then it says in verse 22, and the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and sore upon Egypt, and upon Pharaoh, and upon all his house before our eyes. So I was this, and then God did these great signs in my life. He started to lead me to himself. He started to push people out of my life that were hindering me. He started to direct me to people that were teaching me the Bible. I started seeing the Bible everywhere I looked. Scriptures were just coming alive to me. I couldn't get away from the truth. All these signs and wonders. And now looking back, I can see God was just in my life, keeping me from death, keeping me from hell, keeping me from dying. A lot of us can look back and say, man, I should have died. But God kept me alive so that he could save me. And, and, he, and he did that out of his grace and out of his mercy. And we can tell our people that are after us, we can tell the young people that are growing up after us that, hey, I was a bondman and I was in a dire strait and God showed great signs to me. Next we can say in verse 23 that he brought us. He brought us out from fence that he might bring us in to give us the land which he swear unto our fathers. When the children ask us of the statutes and of the judgments and of the laws and of, of, of what mean these things? Why do we go to church? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? We can show them, well, I was this and now I am that. Why? Because God showed great signs and wonders and he hath given me everything that I have this day. We need to bring that into focus all the time, the great and wonderful and perfect gifts that God has given us. Not just salvation, but just think long and hard. Count your many blessings, name them one by one, the wonderful gifts that God has bestowed upon you. All that He has given you, it is just you simply pointing to the fact that it was the Lord that did these things, the Lord that brought me up. It's all about Him. Verse 12 says, Beware lest thou forget the Lord. Beware lest thou forget it was Him that brought us forth. It was Him that dug us up. It was Him that kept us alive. It was Him that was able to care for us and keep us. Don't forget those things. And definitely don't forget to remind the generations to come of all these things, lest they suffer the same fate that you did. The only way we're going to increase and encourage and, and grow as a people is always improve after. Does that make sense? So the next generation should be more faithful than us. And then the next generation after them should be more faithful than us. We should be just feeding them with stories that bring God glory and showing them the statutes that point to his righteousness and always lifting him up as a testimony to them in order that they would follow after us. Verse 24, it says, The Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to 
to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. And that's what we always forget, that the God of heaven gave us these commands for our good always. Not some of the time, not most of the time, not uh, that benefits us in some ways. No, the statutes and judgments and commands are there for our good always and forever. The purpose of those is to benefit us, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. To benefit us and to preserve us alive. And that is how a nation, especially the nation of God's people, the nation of Israel, will flourish and will grow. It's because we've leaned upon the statutes, trusted the God that gave him, and believed that he is there and doing so for our own good to preserve us alive. And just seek after him and seek after him and seek after him. Verse 25 says, And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before our Lord our God, as he hath commanded us. Is this a self-righteousness? Is it my righteousness because I kept the great law? And I wouldn't have even known the law until God showed it to me. I wouldn't even have had the power to do God's law if I didn't follow after his foundational, loving him and loving your neighbor. It's his righteousness upon us if we observe to do it. It's all going to be glory to him in the end. And that's exactly what he said back in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 6, he said, Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding. In the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statutes and shall say, Surely this nation is a wise and understanding people. Why are they seen as a wise and understanding people? Because of the commands that God has given them. Because of the judgments that God has given them. There's nothing in them to do these things. But it's the sight that they see is that these follow after God and God preserves them. God keeps them. God carries them through all of their statutes. And that should be what the nation see. That should be also what the children see. We don't want them to forget. So what do we do? Bring it to their remembrance. Talk with it when you're in the way. Talk with it when you sit down and rise up. These things should be meditations on your heart all the time, it says in Joshua chapter 1. Meditate upon these, for then thou shalt have good success. And we need to instill this in our children. Not that we, oh, I go to church because every Sunday I got it. When God says, forsake not the assembly. No, we love God and love our neighbor, and everything else is just an exhibition of it. It's just the outpouring of God's love working into us to do these things, to want to do these things, to grow in these things, to be strengthened in these things, and then to teach others otherwise. The best teacher is not just do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. The best teacher is actually, he says in Deuteronomy chapter 4, 6, they see the prosperity, they see the joy, they see the love, they see the strength, they see the success, and they're like, where is this coming from? And you remind them, don't forget, God carried us out of a pit. He saved us alive. He gave us statutes and judgments that we can live by and follow after. And the more I love, the more I follow, the more I seek Him, the more of the success and the joy and the love comes to me. You want to learn this? First love God. Okay? And then start after His statutes. And allow the love of God to be shown in your neighbor. And hey, that's, that's the recipe for success. Jesus Christ said it himself. When we do that, when we don't forget that it's all foundationally set in God and in our interaction with Him, we just grow and grow and grow. It's stronger and stronger and stronger as an individual, as a church, as a nation of God. I'm thankful that God gave us these statutes and, and did it so that He could preserve us.